Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton. Earlier this month, I sat down with LA Daily News columnist Doug McIntyre and television producer and former network executive Steve Leon to discuss a wide range of topics, including politics, the media, and where the country goes with our ongoing cultural and political divide. So here's part two of that conversation. I hope you enjoy it. So what else? I mean, there's so much happening. You've got the the aftermath of, of Hurricane Ian. You've got Trump's appeal to SCOTUS, which, <laughs> boy, the logic of that appeal, I'm sure you could opine on that for a few hours, Doug, that apparently a federal appellate court does not have jurisdiction over a federal district court in the minds of uh, Trump's Trump's attorneys? Well, I, I saw the headline. I paid no attention to it. Again, I, I retreat to I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a legal mind, frankly. So I suppose the law is whatever the Supreme Court says it is until we've destroyed any confidence in that institution. That we're, happened we're, about we're, four months ago, but go yeah, on. Yeah, well, it's been heading there for a while. <laughs> I go back to 2000. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's been heading there for a while. But uh so, uh, you know, maybe he's counting on again. He looks at the Supreme Court justices as he's appointed as as his acolytes, that these are people that owe him. So he doesn't look at I don't think he looks at it. I don't believe his lawyers, by the way, think it's a legitimate claim. I just think that their boss, the guy who's allegedly paying them, wanted this filed. So they filed a brief and he's just hoping that Clarence Thomas and Neil Gorsuch and those people will just go along with him. Well, you know, it's the old uh, Wayne Gretzky line. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Right. Yeah. So you you have to appeal it. I'm sure it's the lawyers that came up with this. It seems like too arcane a legal concept for Trump to have. Oh, he didn't come up with it. He just said, dude, take it to the Supreme Court. And then then they go and figure out some way to to throw it. And look, you know, we can be glib about this. And then, you know, a month from now when they rule in his favor, (laughs) then it'll be a story. Then we're going to actually have to read the stuff. Yeah, there's always that chance. But even but even if that doesn't happen, you know, the other part of the game is delay, delay, delay with the hope that, you know, with a new, let's say, Republican Congress, maybe they will so inundate Merrick Garland with impeachment inquiries that he won't have, you know, enough bandwidth to carry through on this. Yeah, well, let's if you're in power, you can control committee chairmen. You kill the January 6th hearings. You start Hunter Biden hearings and. You change the narrative completely. Absolutely. Sure. sure. Yeah. Let's see what else. Uh, did you re- hear about this? That Poland offered to host U.S. nukes because they're sweating it out now with what's going on in Ukraine. That's a strange thing to uh, to host. Like, like I said, <laughs> I'll dog sit for the weekend. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, as I uh, said, is that like hosting a foreign exchange student? A- <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, could you send your nukes over here for a week for a visit? By the way, I don't think we generally do that. Uh, well, it worked not. so well with the Jupiters in Turkey in 1962. Right. I, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that that's really a great idea, because here's the thing. If they hit Poland, look, we're so close to uh, we're, we're really on a razor's edge here with this. This is such a hugely serious situation that uh, I, I, to a certain extent, I think we can l- have some nervous laughter around it just to keep our own sanity. But we have a very dangerous person who is cornered, wounded, guilty of war crimes, and can physically physically not survive failure here. And he's got nothing but failure. It, it, and, uh, you know, the most dangerous animal is the wounded animal. And, right. uh, and Putin is a wounded animal, all self-inflicted. But he's a nuclear armed wounded animal, and it's really serious. Yeah. So I want to ask you, Doug, now, you're, I don't know what you self identify as politically these days. I mean, obviously, you're right of center conservative. Right. Probably at some point identified as a Republican. Definitely for most of my life. Until, in fact, until January 6th, on January 7th, I sent a letter to Kevin McCarthy saying I changed my voter registration because of you. Yeah. Because yeah. you know better. And he called you the loser of the day, I think. Uh, should have been anyway. <laughs> and, and maybe I am. Uh, so, so I, and I changed my party registration to uh, decline to state or no party preference. Uh, because I think the, the Democratic Party is a few years behind the Republicans, but headed in, this, in the opposite but equal direction in the sense that 
the Freedom Caucus and, and the Tea Party and those people that dragged the right off a cliff, uh, who eviscerated people that they had supported for decades as rhinos. I think the left is, and when you have, you know, AOC and, 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 and people saying that, you know, Dianne Feinstein isn't a liberal or isn't a progressive and it, she's, de, she's got dementia, she's decrepit, that's a fair criticism. But to invalidate somebody's lifetime of service to the causes that you, whatever, the point is, is that they're dragging, I believe, the next generation is dragging the party farther to the left than the country is. The way these people have dragged the Republican Party farther to the right than the country is. I think that this abortion issue is a classic example. While most Americans do not want unrestricted abortion, they also don't want totally restricted abortion. And uh, so, so the extremes are the extremes. So the reason that I asked you about your your partisan political affiliation is to bring up actually the the topic of this potential nuclear conflict or whatever you want to call this because clearly we're fighting a proxy war now mm-hmm. uh, that Ukraine is is on the front line. I don't think it's a war of choice for the United States. Some people seem to think it is. I think that that's ludicrous. But, you know, by the very definition of of what NATO is and where Ukraine is placed and what Russia has done by invading them, we are now fighting like the the NATO front in, in Ukraine. With that said, what is it about the Republican Party that you used to be a part of who, yes, there's always been political divides, especially domestically in the United States. But when it came to foreign affairs, especially in times of war, usually the, the the protocol was you don't speak against your country and you don't speak against your commander in chief and your president when your nation is at war, even indirectly, with a foreign nation, especially one as dangerous as Russia. And yet we now have Tucker Carlson and so many on the right are actively trying to, you know, they're, they're taking Putin's side. I mean, let's just make it that clear. Yeah, I, it's fascinating and horrifying at the same time. Uh, you know, Harry Truman got very mad at Dwight Eisenhower in uh, 1952 during that campaign because Eisenhower campaigned on the Korean War as an issue, and and Truman said, "We didn't do that to you when you were running uh, the." Uh, allied forces. We, you know, you know, Wendell Wilkie and LB and FDR were on the same page right. uh, when it came to the war. So there, there have always been obviously people who have, you go back to McClellan running against Lincoln, if you want. Uh, so there, there have always been, even on the subject of war, a, a divergence of opinion, but this notion that somehow there are people on the far right today who are identifying with the strongman Putin, as well as the guy in Hungary and and others? They're now like cheer, already cheerleading the the the, the crypto fascist in Italy. They're they're identifying uh, this ideological fight that we've seen in this country has now spilled into international politics. And the thing is, with with precious little information. I mean, that's the thing. You got people opining on a subject that they know almost nothing about. I mean, really almost nothing about it. And that's disturbing to me. I mean, again, look, we're all in the opinion business. That's why we're we're on a podcast, right? Talking about the issues of the day. And I made a living in the opinion business for all those years and still doing the newspaper, but I don't want to drive over a bridge that was built on an opinion. I want somebody (laughs) to actually know how to work a slide rule. (laughs) But we've blown up facts. Facts are now just whatever you can make people believe them to be. And that's really disturbing. Some things are, look, some things are just a matter of opinion. If there's a, a car accident, a fender bender, and somebody, a cop shows up to take an accident report, and they talk to the guy in the northeast corner, and he tells them what he saw, and then talks to the guy on the southwest corner, uh, and he tells them what he saw, are they liars? Or did they just see it from different places? Most of life is that. But but what we've done now, package arrived. Uh, but but uh, but what we've done now is we've 
metastasized all of these d- basically polit- viewpoint differences into lying and and theft and 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 evil that the other side is they're evil yeah and i don't know how you pull back from that yeah steve thoughts yeah this is a, a couple of things here one this is a key tenant in the uh in the trump philosophy that and and by the way the also the uh putin philosophy that there are no such thing as facts. There are only subjective opinions that you present as facts. Mm-hmm. And 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 that once you once you lose the ability to talk from a factual base, then everything is is simply opinion, and and that's it. Number two, uh, uh, what you're saying, uh, Doug, about Tucker Carlson and others. I mean, this was happening is in, in 1939 in the midst. Of, of of Hitler's rise, yep. the American Nazi Party had twenty thousand people fill Madison Square Garden for yeah. a rally. Charles Lindbergh was uh, considered uh, a, a, an ally and a potential compatriot of Hitler's. So America's been down this road before. It's not a surprise it's going down again. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's a global phenomenon. I mentioned it. Sweden is taking a step to the right. Uh, uh, Italy just took a big step to the right. We saw what's gone on in Hungary. The Poles, also, by the way, Polish politics, very much. And and I have a friend who actually uh, has a house in Poland. And I just uh, had lunch with him a couple of weeks ago and was asking him about this. And uh, and he said it's it, it, the the Poles are very divided on this issue because. They have a long, everything about Poland has a, is a long, ugly history. It's a country that has had, maybe Haiti uh, has a worse history, but not many countries have a worse history than Poland. But as a result, they have ancient animosity towards the Ukrainians. A lot of people over there dislike Zelensky. They're also having the social disturbance of thousands upon thousands of refugees coming across. And that is always a societal disturbance wherever it happens throughout all of history. So it's complicated. But you're right, Steve. This is this is definitely on the rise. And the obliteration, I know we lost your phone call before I was mentioning how Steve Bannon outright said in an interview with Bloomberg that we are going to flood the zone with bullshit. And they coined the term alternative facts. And it's very hard to reach consensus and govern a nation this big when people are running around with two plus two equals five. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I'll go into something that Steve Bannon said that, that speaks to what you were just saying as well. He believes that the European model and, and, and uh, the Israeli model for how uh, political parties are, are, are being formed is now going to be the norm throughout the world so that you won't just have a Republican and a Democratic party, but you are going to have four, five, six parties that are going to be having to form alliances in order to win power. This is what happened with Maloney in in Italy. She won power with 25% of the vote. Well, Hitler won power with 32% of the vote, and Italy has 167 registered political parties. India has over 800. And, And that's how you end up with these unnatural alliances where you have communists and Satanists who have two seats in the, you know, in the parliament who have to form a coalition and you end up with these nat- unnatural. By the way, this is what Hitler, why Hitler thought he could win, because he thought that the United States and England in a uh, an alliance with the communist Stalin uh, made no sense. He said these are these are natural enemies. And, and in fact, he appealed to Churchill to say, you should be my ally, you know, uh, but but uh, but I think you're totally right, Steve, and it's a real problem. And we saw that when Ross Perot ran. So we had a, a we had a whole bunch of presidents who were becoming president with less than 50 percent of the vote. And yeah. Bill Clinton never got 50 percent of the vote. Well, he did his second. Oh, it, he not in the second time. What no, did he, get? he didn't. Yeah. He didn't because Ross Perot sucked off enough uh, enough uh, energy out of the out of the popular vote. Anyway, the point is, is that you end up with minority government. Yeah, yeah. Well, within within a, a decade, I think it's likely that you may have four political parties in the United States. Steve, you may the be MAGA right. MAGA party on one level. What? You, you may be right. I, I think that will be the death of the United States, worse even than a, 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 a bloody civil war, because 
Once you, you know, I know people have been saying for years, oh, we need a, we need a third party. We need ranked choice voting. If we stray from a two party system, this country will not work like Britain works or like other where you have to, like you said, form an alliance, form a coalition. It will become that, that one, one type of ideology will become splintered. I believe it will become liberal ideology. And the other side will stay will stay uh, together, and they will just dominate politics forever. Well, I think. Well, you're right. if you look at if you look at the Republican Party now, they have splintered. You now have a very big portion of the Republican conservative base that has pulled themselves away from MAGA. They are now upward of ten percent and and rising. Yeah, but they're uh, still going to vote have... for. They're still all going to vote for Ron DeSantis if he gets the nomination. No, they're going to be, I mean, they're going to be people who are, say, going to go in the, uh, maybe the Larry Hogan camp, as an example. And and you're going to start to see some pulling away. And on the Democratic end, I, I, I think, Doug, you hit it right on the, on, on the head. You've got a very, very strong left-wing part of the Democratic Party that doesn't feel things are moving as quickly as they can under Joe Biden, or should. And they are going to start to split away from the more independent, moderate part of the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's the, I think that's my concern. Maybe that's because I'm I'm partisan and biased to begin with, but my concern is that the the what I consider the left wing of American politics, whether it's you know moderate Democrat, progressive, liberal, whatever you know, socialist, whatever terms you want to put on it, that we will become the fragmented side. Go ahead, Doug. Well, you know, the country has worked through civil war, through, you know, the depression, through World War II, the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera, because the center has held. It it didn't hold, by the way, in the civil war, obviously, hence the civil war. That's the one time it literally broke down. And and by the center, I mean the center both politically and economically. And and, and this was Madison's vision of of both uh, religious freedom and and uh, throwing the biggest make creating the biggest republic possible. The idea is that the competing I- interests would force people to the center in a compromise in order to move forward. Uh, and what happens is when you get to Steve's vision, which I mean, no, it's not your vision, but your prediction. And I, I, I it's certainly headed that way. The more we fragment, uh, the harder it is to reach that consensus. And and the more the gap between the super wealthy and this and the poor, the the more the the economic center feels pressure, the more attractive some of these promises that are made by the far left or the far right become to them. Uh, and, And that it can drive people who should naturally be in the center, the glue that holds it together, both economically and politically, start to gravitate to the radicals. And that's how that's what happened in Germany. I mean, that's a. I mean, I think that's what happened to both Italy and in Sweden, that that you have had social Democrats dominate politics, certainly in Sweden for almost 80 years. So as a result, they've got huge gas price, energy concerns. They've got a flood of immigrants coming into the country. They're feeling all kinds of pressure and they really don't have an option. They've had this same form of government for a very long period of time. And I don't know that all of a sudden they've become crypto fascist, but they're just saying, let's try the other guys. You know, they did it. The Mexicans did it when the PRI party had been in power for 72 years uh, and and then finally collapsed. It it wasn't, you know, eventually they just said, look, this isn't, this just isn't working. People talk, uh, people talk about Donald Trump being one of a kind and unique, and nobody has ever been in politics like him, et cetera, et cetera. But you only have to go back to the 30s to look at Huey Long. Right. And Huey Long was a, a far left populist who became extraordinarily popular. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the, the, the chicken in every pot mm-hmm. uh, uh, phrase that came from <laughs> Huey Long. Until he was assassinated, Huey Long was an extreme threat to take over the presidency from Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, 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 and over time, people who are having economic troubles, they, they gravitate to, to strong authoritarian leaders who say, I alone can fix it. Yep. Yep. Uh, and by the way, uh, the night that Huey Long was killed, 
FDR ordered champagne. He had champagne served <laughs> at the, at the <laughs> White House. He did. He literally did. Uh, there were no tears shed <laughs> at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue when Huey Long. Well, went he was down. a real he was a real threat to American democracy at he a time was, when absolutely. around the world populism and authoritarianism was rearing its head, not just with Hitler, but obviously Mussolini in, in Italy, Stalin in, 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 in Russia, and, and, and Franco in, 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 in Spain. I mean, it was a dangerous time, just like it is today. Yeah, and, and, and of course, the military despotism in Japan, which was, you know, that's pe- right. People forget World War II started in 1931. Yeah. You know, yeah. 10 years before Pearl Harbor, they were already at war in Asia. Uh, in a very ugly way. So, and, and uh, Mussolini went into North Africa, into Ethiopia, uh, what, in 35 or six or something like that. So, so uh, yes, the world was a very dangerous place then, and it's a very dangerous place today for different reasons. It's both uh, probably a wonderful thing about human nature that we somehow, at least in this country, until now, we have always believed that things basically are going to work out, that things will be okay. And, and there are cultures where there's a, there's a per- perpetual dark cloud over people's heads. And Russia, by the way, is one of them. Yeah. Another country with a terrible history. <laughs> All back centuries. It's never been, never been good, frankly. So That's why they drink so much. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a it's a when you know Russian history, you realize they they had centuries of horrific oppression from their own government and chattel slavery. I mean, we, they call them serfs, but they were slaves, literally. I mean, if you were a landowner and you had thirty thousand serfs, they were your property. You could give them away. You could give them as wedding presents, and they did. I mean, it was terrible. And then they went from that to. Uh, you know, something certainly uh, arguably worse than Hitler because they were more successful. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Hitler imploded after 12 years and Stalin and Lenin and Stalin got to go for 70. So- <laughs> we'll be back with a look at how the news media affects our cultural divide right after this. There's a topic that I've really wanted to discuss with both of you for a long time, and I'm so glad to have you both here today, which is about broadcast news. Now, everybody knows we've got the cable universe and whether uh, it's Fox on the right and MSNBC on the left. And a lot of people would throw CNN in there as as left leaning in their in their perspective. What news network? The Clinton News Network. Yeah. But I want to ask you guys, I've had a theory. I see a lot in my conversations on social media. I see a lot of people saying, you know, I, I wish, you know, I hearken back to the days of Walter Cronkite. Why can't we get back to journalists who just report the news? And I'm not sure that that is really as true as it's more of a meme that we have created over time. So I want to ask you both, was it really that much more, well, it was more balanced, but was there really no partisanship at all in news in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s? Can you really say that Wolf Blitzer and Lester Holt and Nora O'Donnell and David Muir are really more biased than a Cronkite or a John Chancellor? Is Rachel Maddow or Anderson Cooper more partisan than Edward R. Murrow or Mike Wallace? were in their day? And, and is Don Lemon more fringe than William F. Buckley Jr. was? Well, I'll take, I'll take the first stab here. I don't think that the, the main news networks, the main broadcast networks, were ever any different than they were today. If you look at, as an example, their coverage of the McCarthy era in the 50s, yes, they were absolutely on the same wavelength as the broadcast networks today are during the, the, the Trump investigations. It's no different. I agree. But I the agree. the one thing that is different, as as many, many people have said, and what Roger Ailes really wrought, was the advent of the cable news channels that appeal to specific uh, interest groups. The cable news channels. Those are opinion stations. Are talk radio with cameras. I mean, that's okay. what they are. Yeah, but, but with, point, with, with specific point of view. Well, talk radio had specific point of view. Well, well okay. Yes, you could say... 
Lawrence O'Donnell, you know, goes goes too far on the left and and whatever you want to call Joe Scarborough these days, I can't even categorize him anymore. Or Tucker Carlson. You can take Tucker, Tucker Carlson and other people. But what about people like Wolf Blitzer, Anderson Cooper? I mean, I could go down a list of people on CNN and a couple actually on MSNBC, call me crazy, who I think are doing legitimate broadcast journalism. Are they really all that far out or is it just certain commentator segments, commentator time slots? Well, look, this is this is my opinion for what it's worth. I, I think that we did have from I'm going to say from the late 40s, from the war, from from the 40s until the very early 70s. I think that we had a golden era where there was professional journalism. People went to journalism school and they the credentialed journalists strived for an objectivity in the reportage of facts. but. Before then, look, the New York Post was founded by Alexander Hamilton as an anti-Jeffersonian paper, and Jefferson funded the Aurora in Philadelphia as an anti-Washington administration paper. So uh, the first thing you did when you ran for office was open a newspaper (laughs) to put out your message. And that was really not, uh, uh, nobody objected to it. That's just the way you were reading the Jefferson paper, the Hamilton paper. And then it became a profession with a code of ethics. But the masthead of the New York Times still says all the news that's fit to print. But human beings make the determination of what's fit. And that's where the bias comes in. And oftentimes, in my opinion, the bias is unconscious. Uh, And I'll give you a perfect example of it. The other night, actually, this this was actually a pretty conscious decision. And we, we were talking about Roger Stone before. When these videos from this Danish filmmaker showed up recently of D- Roger Stone right around January 6th, there's a on NBC Nightly News, which we watch every night. We watch the Lester Holt show. Uh, they had a report and they were talking about the violence of January 6th and, and whether Trump was directly involved. And then they cut to one of the clips of Roger Stone talking to the Danish filmmakers where he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, he goes, well, he was in favor, but he was surrounded by weak bureaucrats. Words to that effect. But here's the problem. I had read the transcript earlier that day, and that quote was in direct response to a question about his request for a preemptive pardon. It was not connected to advocating violence on January 6th, but the way they cut the tape They made it look like Roger Stone was saying that the president was in favor of it, but his weak. Now, that's a kind of somebody made a choice to attach that video out of context. Uh, And and, and that's ham fist. Most of the time, it's a it's a cultural ethos within the newsroom. And, and I, you know, Kevin, as you know, and I don't know, Steve, you know, for years, uh, my, my big issue in talk radio was illegal immigration, very yeah. much opposed to illegal immigration. And, and the language was literally taken from us. The Associated Press banned the use of the term illegal immigrant from news copy as if it's hate speech. And, you know, they used to use the sophistry that the word alien, it's offensive. And it said, yeah, well, nobody objects when it says resident alien on a green card. So right. that word is not offensive. Right. The word that they objected to was illegal, not alien. Uh, but the thing is, is that on one side, because of sensitivity issues or historic discrimination or any of the myriad reasons that they may have arrived at that decision. But when this is where Orwell comes in, where the language itself has been weaponized, then it just and, it be, and, and, and when you see in newsrooms, every opinion poll shows that overwhelmingly newsrooms are dominated by people with a progressive point of view. That's the work they go into. They choose to do that. And, and conservatives tend not to, uh, not universally, but they tend to. So it becomes a thing where something can creep in, a bias creeps in without anybody even knows. And that's where the people choosing what's fit to print bring a bias to the program. Now, with all this said, there's still wonderful reporters. There are still people who go out every day. There are people who are leftists who I've watched who have done fantastic reports because their interests bring them to cover a story that somebody on the right might not be interested in. The problem comes in is when, and Kevin, this will make it crazy, but the guy who got Hunter Biden's laptop, for instance, 
said, how come a conservative whistleblower gets crushed? You know, and that's and that's a real issue is that when you have a newsroom dominated by one point of view, when somebody on the other side goes, hey, wait a second. And they just say, shut up. <laughs> it's me on that, you finger pointer, you. <laughs> but Doug, Doug, your point, your point is outstanding. And I want to take it just a step further. I used to be a network executive. So I understand it from a different perspective myself. But you have corporate overlords mm -hmm. and you have heads of news departments. And believe me, they are looking at every single day of the telecast and they are shaping the telecast and giving notes about what was good, what wasn't, and how they want to do things differently. And over time, there is a perspective that those bosses give to the newscasts. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but but the problem is, is that those people live in the Northeast Corridor from Atlanta to Boston, or they live on the West Coast and they they go to cocktail parties and they go like, for instance, I'm convinced CNN created Donald Trump more than anybody else. They gave him the keys to the network. He, he could call in and they just put a, a slide up and it'd say on the phone, Donald Trump. They weren't doing that for the three term governor of New York, George Pataki, who was also running. They just gave Donald Trump the network. And then when Chris Cuomo and, and, and Anderson Cooper would go out to their Southampton DACA's uh, and people started kicking him in the balls and saying, you, what did you do? You gave that fucking guy a platform. They, they gave him two billion dollars worth of free media free advertising. <laughs> so that's you know, that's the problem. The problem is, is that, again, that newsroom mindset. You know, look, those of us who live out and all three of us, you know, Steve, you're still out in the West in L.A. area and, and I am, too. And Kevin, you certainly did your time here. They referred to it as flyover country. They referred to it. My friend John Phillips, who's a conservative Trumpish talk show host in New York, he told in, uh, in still in L.A., he had the greatest line during covid before before the election. He was driving cross country. He was driving cross country before the election. And he said, in order of appearance, this is the signage you see in middle America. Trump, firewood for sale, Biden. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and I do think now more people live on the coast, but the media shapers live in that. And that's those are the cocktail parties they go to. Those are the people they interact with on the weekend in their social life. And it has an impact. It definitely has. And I'm going to take this now right back around to where we started, because you are going right to my point about the fact that this country is now being divided mm -hmm. into two very separate bases. I totally agree. I totally agree with you. OK, well, with that, I'm going to take cover in my fallout shelter or just my bunker and get ready for the oncoming onslaught, because uh, I'm now convinced that the shooting is going to start within the next uh, 36 hours. I uh, don't worry about it. We're going to get nuked before then. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you both for joining. Uh, I'm a little been, optimist. <laughs> this has been, I just love talking with both of you. Uh, I could listen to you guys talk all day, and I think I did. You did, so, yeah. Steve, thank you so much. Uh, I know you had a little bit of technical difficulty along the way, but we got that straightened out. I hope you had fun still. This was great fun. And I, I just want to tell both of you guys how much I enjoyed talking with you. And especially, Doug, I'll tell you, your perspective and especially your your knowledge of history, it really made it a joy to take part. Oh, uh, thanks. That's very kind of you. I appreciate it. I, and agree. I certainly enjoyed talking. <laughs> yes, you, without being too much of a kiss ass, Doug, I could listen to you talk all day long. So, and I want to thank you for taking time away from I know you've got a hectic schedule, you were telling me before we started, of writing and getting ready to do a series. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the speaker series that you do? Yeah, it's the greatest gig. Uh, many years ago, uh, there's a distinguished speaker series in Southern California. It's run by two wonderful women, Kathy Winterhalter and her sister, Sue Swan. And this is the 26th year, and it's the Chautauqua. They bring in usually uh, eight to 10 speakers. They play five theaters uh, around Southern California. And they started hiring me to do when, when they were the first one was Robert Redford. Robert Redford was doing it and he didn't have a stump speech. So he wanted to do an evening with where you're just on stage with him. And it's a conversation. I remember sitting on stage at the Ambassador Auditorium in uh, Pasadena with Robert Redford, like a foot and a half from me. 
thinking, why am I here and not in the second balcony <laughs> with, you know, the people from the Elks Lodge who came in on a charter, you know, I, so it's really kind of a, been a wonderful gig and I've met some amazing people. Uh, just rattle off do, a few. I did Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin on the same night, the two of them together, George W. Bush last year, Malala Yousafzai, uh, Colin Powell, a couple of nights with Ken Burns, uh, Steve Martin. Uh, and they're done in different nights. cities, right? Yeah, they, they, it's Pasadena, Beverly Hills, Thousand Oaks, Redondo Beach. And it was at the Seagramson Center in Orange County. And then they moved to the Terrace Theater in Long Beach. John Cleese, four or five nights, just, uh, you know, it, you know, Ron, how I mean, the whole bunch of them. And you've uh, got a series coming up with Misty Copeland, right? Yeah, five nights with the uh, African American uh, prima ballerina uh, Misty Copeland, which is going to be really fat. And that just you know went uh, October sixteenth through the twentieth, uh, which is going to okay. be a lot of fun. Do you know really what? Which is it in one of the theaters, or are you going up and down the coast with that? Uh, it's all five. It's okay. uh, we start in Beverly Hills, then Pasadena, Thousand Oaks, uh, Redondo, and uh, no uh, Long Beach, and then uh, Redondo. We did uh, last year for the first time. I went to Washington and did a taped one with Bob Woodward and we taped it at the Watergate hotel, which was fun because he, he had been postponed three times because of COVID and they couldn't get him back on the schedule because the theaters were having COVID, you know, outbreaks and, and they just to, to get them off the books uh, for the first and only time, hopefully they taped it, but it's been great. I mean, over there, they had Gorbachev, they've had, you know, they get amazing people. They get really uh, uh, amazing people. So uh, amazingly, George W. did not want to do a speech because the politicians almost always want to speak. He just wanted to do a conversation, which was really kind of fascinating. That's great. And you get yeah. to meet and talk to all yeah. these people. Wow. Well, anyways, I'm going to let you guys go. I want to thank our listeners for listening. If you like what we do here, please share our link on your Facebook timeline and your other social media so your friends can find out about us as well. And for that, this is The More Perfect Union. I'm Kevin Kelton saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 